Good evening and a very warm welcome to a special edition of News with Tonga this week. Making headlines, the Majesty's King Duval VI and Queen and Aspa all met the British monarch in an official audience. His Royal Highness Crown Prince the Bodo Galala welcomed the National Rugby League team Matema Tonga. Tongan government provides 400,000 paanga for three different sports events and Lord Marf officially opened the Friendly Islands Shipping Agency new office. These are more stories later on in this bulletin. I'm Fatai Fenga'a with the detail. The Majesty's King, the Royal VI and Queen Anaspa'o had an audience with the British monarch Queen Elizabeth II last evening, local time at the Buckingham Palace in London. Information from the Royal Correspondent website of London reports that Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II was pleased to greet and meet the King and Queen of Tonga. Before an audience with Queen Elizabeth, King Dubois VI and Queen Anaspao met with the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester on Tuesday. Their Majesties are in the UK as part of preparations for King Dubois VI's coronation in 2015. Their Majesties are expected to return to Tonga at the end of the month. His Royal Highness Crown Prince Dubota Ulkalala was at the Parliament House this week with the Speaker of the House, Lord Fafanua, and members of Parliament welcoming the National Rugby League team, Matema Tonga. The team arrived at Famoto International Airport early on Thursday morning. His Royal Highness Crown Prince Dubota Ulkalala was at the Legislative Assembly to welcome the Matema Tonga team. The Speaker of the House, Lord Fafanua, and fellow parliamentarians were also at Parliament House wearing red to show their support of Tonga's national rugby team. The team was introduced to the Speaker and the rest of the members of Parliament. In a speech from the Acting Prime Minister, Sami Polo, he says they are optimistic of the team's performance in the upcoming Rugby League World Cup. We may be small. We may not be many, but we have the heart. We have the courage, and we have the will to win. Today, His Majesty and the people of Tonga is here to give you all the support and our trust. that the games you'll be playing, we must win it. Meanwhile, the Speaker of the House, Lord Fafanua, spoke of rugby league's history in Tonga. Rugby team was first introduced to Tonga in 1986. The first president was Noble Fustoa. It was a new sport which was difficult to teach the rules to the people. In the Rugby League World Cup in 1998, 1988 rather, Tonga was qualified to the 1995 Games. Tonga played such a good game, even New Zealand was scared of our team. It was such a historical moment for Tonga, which people are still talking about up to now. The Honourable Minister of Internal Affairs presented a gift to the Matema Tonga team. I give thanks to, to, to our coach, Charlie, you know, thank God for him because uh, he's the reason I come to play for Tonga when I mean, he told me that he wants to play in, in God's honour um, that was enough for me um, to come and play and, and represent, represent the country that I've been brought up to, um, to love and the Reverend there I think they're teaching, teaching the boys some, some really good things here about our culture and our proud history and our Christian history. Um, 
and I think you know we're borrowing from the coat of arms in our in, in, in our motto and you know God God and Tonga is our inheritance too um, my team is this is the best team ever assembled to represent this little nation I'm very proud to to go and play with them um, my mum <laughs> my mum said that we have to be like the proverb um, the old Tongan proverb <laughs> ala isia ala i kolo, kolonga thank you so they're the best they're the best at what they do and as I said they're the best team we've ever put together and we're so proud to, to run out and represent this country. The Prime Minister, Lord Divano, is expected to return to Tonga next Wednesday, October 16th. The Acting Chief Secretary and Secretary to Cabinet, Ahal Topalo, has confirmed that the Prime Minister, Lord Divano, is expected to arrive in Auckland this Friday, uh, October 11th. The Prime Minister and accompanying delegation departed New York last weekend after his Lordship received medical treatment. This followed the conclusion of the United Nations General Assembly high-level meetings where Tongan missions have provided an overwhelming outpour of support in view of Lord Duvano's remarkable stewardship and landmark achievements made on behalf of the region this year during the high-level meetings of the 68th session of the United Nations General Assembly. The Prime Minister was also greeted by members of the Tongan community in San Francisco on his way back to Tonga. The Tongan government provides 100,000 paanga for free different sport events. The funds are delegated as assistance to the National Rugby Union team Ikaletahi, the National Rugby League team Matematonga and Tonga sports team for the Winter Olympic Games to be held in Russia. Kalisto Yonuko has the details. The Honourable Minister of Internal Affairs, Lord Vaya, revealed the government assistance after it was approved by Cabinet. Cabinet has agreed to delegate 250,000 paanga for the Matematonga squad to help in their preparation to join the Rugby League World Cup held in the UK towards the end of the month. 100,000 paanga will go to the Ikalitahi team and 50,000 paanga is delegated to the Tongan team preparing for the Winter Olympic Game. The total amount of the fund is 400,000 paanga. Lord Vaya says the fund provided is not the full amount of initial monetary assistance requested by the various sports team. The initial request submitted from this sports team was for 1 million paanga, but the government could only afford to approve almost half of what they asked for. The funds approved will help with the allowance of the Tongan players for both Matema Tonga squad and the Ikalitahi team. Meanwhile, the Ikalitahi team will leave next month on the Europe tour, while the Matema Tonga team leave next week for the Rugby League World Cup 2013 in England as well. The Minister of uh, Land, Survey, Environment, Climate Change and Natural Resources, Lord Maafu, officially opened the Friendly Island Shipping Agency new office at the Quinsalote Wharf. Lord Maafu officially unveiling the block and officially opening the newly constructed building, estimated at 450,000 paanga, funded by the Board's Authority. The office is situated at the Quinsalote Wharf near the vessel's boarding cargoes and passengers area. In a remarks from the chairman of the Boards Authority's board, Stephen Atwoods, he says, this is part of their vision to enhance the long-term value of its operations and ensure its profitability. This building was built primarily for the purpose of housing the Friendly Island Shipping Agency, which we were happy to provide as part of our master plan for the development of the port of Nualofa. FISA is reorganizing its operation to provide better services to the public. And what we see here today is the result of the agreement between the Ports Authority and FISA. He adds this new move was after they were made aware that the current location of FISA's office is of the former manager and therefore had to move. However, they will look at occupying the area for the local vessels' slipway to cut cost for the local vessels. Already we have 
resurface, berth number two, for international ships at a cost of $1 million. Purchased two rich stackers at $700,000 each, totaling $1.4 million for easy and fast movement of containers. Install mobile power points at a cost of 100000 to assist agricultural exporters, especially the squash exporters. Concreting the surface of berth number three, <coughs> as well as the loading bay costing 500000 for use by the MV Odwanga Ofa and the local ships. All these works have been done through self-financing. Attending the program was the Honourable Minister of Public Enterprises, Ve Avakata, and convey the words of thanks. And as Minister for Public Enterprises, I very much encourage the cooperation and assistance of public enterprises to each other. In this case, the Friendly Islands Shipping Agency officials saw the need to improve the efficiency of its services by having a one-stop shop and a proper place for customer services. Office complex and cargo operation center in support of its inter-island vessel, YMV Odwanga Offer. The board of directors and management of FISA then sought the assistance of the board of directors and management of Ports Authority Tonga, and this is the result of their successful cooperation. Present at the program were ministers of the ground, diplomatic corps, Ports Authority staff, and many guests. The Education Bill 2013 has been submitted to Parliament this week. At the beginning of the parliamentary deliberations, the Minister of Education, Dr. Anna Taufelungaki, elaborates on a bill to the members of the House. The Honourable Minister of Education and Training says they've been working on the bill for the past three years before it was submitted to Parliament. She says the bill aims to replace the Education Act in 1971, although there were amendments made in 1999, 2001, 2002, 2010 and the latest amendment last year. Dr. Taufe Lungaki says minor amendments were made which did not change the content of the Act except for the amendment in 2002 which dissolved the authority of the Minister of Education and transferred it to the Public Service Commission. This is the act regarding the civil servants in 2002. Dr. Taufelungaki told the House the bill also includes changes which apply to all levels of education, and this includes preschools, technical and vocational institutes, and also government assistance towards the education sector. She adds Clause 10 of this bill is significant because it identifies needs to return the minister's authority towards her workers. In the meantime, the legal age for students in Tonga will begin from the age of 13, similar to that of the legal age for education, which began on the age of 4 up to 18. The new policy for the Ministry of Education is also submitted under this bill. After her debate on a bill, the Education Bill 2013 was then approved to pass down to the whole House Committee for further deliberations. An official investigative report carried out by the U.S. Defense Force Chiefs regards local and international media reports which alleges Tongan soldiers were sleeping while on duty in Camp Ashton in Afghanistan when it attacked by Al-Qaeda militants. However, in this um, week's parliamentary discussions, Lord Rafu told the House he had received reliable information which denied the allegations against the Tongan soldiers. The minister in charge, Lord Mafu, told members of parliament that he had received reports from the U.S. military confirming that the Tongan soldiers were not responsible for what happened on September 2012 during the attack in Camp Ashton, Afghanistan. <laughs> Lord Speaker, I've received a military report from the U.S. via its attaché in Suva that the Tongan soldiers had nothing to do with the 2012 attack in Camp Ashton. The same report also clarifies that the allegations against the Tongan soldiers is misleading. This was further clarified by the acting commander of Tonga Defence Service, Captain Tony Fonokalafi, to Television Tonga News. 
The Tongan Defence Service has confirmed that the Tongan soldiers serving at Camp Hashton in Afghanistan did not sleep while they were on duty during the attack, and they were nowhere near the area which the attack occurred which killed two U.S. Marines last September. Reports from local and international media about the incident was based on a result of an investigation about the attack carried out by the U.S. Defence Force. The investigation focused on allegations made by the U.S. media that Tongan soldiers slept while on duty which enable an Al-Qaeda attack on parts of Camp Ashton, which resulted in millions of dollars of damage to several aircraft. However, Captain Fono Kalafi insists that the tower the Tongan soldiers were responsible for was the cure for the Al-Qaeda attack, and the attack occurred in other areas of the camp and not in the area where they were on duty. The Pacific Civil Aviation Safety Authority says new funding from the World Bank will help strengthen the international reputation of air travel in the region. A large part of the 2.15 US million grant will be put towards modernizing information systems and upholding safety regulations. Galilina Donglava reports. The authority's director, Wilson Sagati, told Radio Australia's Pacific Beat program the World Bank funding will help protect against fears of travelling in the region following several disasters in recent years. Mr Sakati says if mechanisms are not put in place to build capacity to meet international aviation safety standards, then the risk will increase in that regard. The upgrade follows a travel advisory from New Zealand over aircraft safety in Tonga, making it hard for tourists to get insurance to travel in the country. That warning also saw the suspension of millions of dollars in tourism fund. Meanwhile, Tongan tourism operator says aircraft safety fears are crippling businesses. In August, New Zealand's Foreign Minister Mar Makali drew attention to the ME60 aircraft gifted by China and operated by Rio Tonga, issuing a travel warning. The MA-60 aircraft is operated by Tonga's domestic air carrier, Real Tonga, for its daily flight operations to Vavao. However, the Chinese embassy in Nukalofa has reaffirmed the safety standards of the MA-60 aircraft. On Rubana Saini, Dubove Hola Fustua attended a program on children-centered climate change adaptation. This was held at the Alona Center this week. The program educates children with disabilities on how to minimize the effects of climate change and natural disasters. Anasi Falikano was there and filed this report. A special workshop is held for children and people with disabilities. The children-centered climate change helps them better understand about climate change and what to do if a disaster strikes. This is during the program of teaching the pupils and the children of the nation the importance of tree planting. Participants are people from the Alonga Centre, of Atuimu Amanaki and students from the GPS Bear. Also during the program, the guest of honour, Honourable Anaseni Fustua, planted a Heilala tree at the Alonga Centre and named it Anaseni Tupolve Holis Heilala Tree. This is to show her full support on tree planting which is one of the minimizing the effects of natural disaster and climate change. From the Ministry of Agriculture, Food, Forestry and Fisheries, Daniela Hopono says it's important to teach children and others with disabilities on ways they can help minimize the effects of climate change. This program is very special because it shows the support from the royal family with the attendance of Honourable Tupolve Hola. She also sets good example to the country by tree planting to combat the negative effects of climate change. Meanwhile, the project manager for CA, Naatayala, says that it is important to educate the children while they're still young so they can become a habit with them. The workshop also serves a platform for everyone here to share their experiences and idea on the issue. In our culture, you can't be outspoken or speak your mind about an issue. In this program, we are encouraging them to share their thoughts and ideas. Lavinia Sardini from Talonga Centre stressed the importance of the program for the members of the centre. 
We've learned so many things from this training, knowing what to do when a disaster occurs, especially a tsunami. We also have plans in place to help us know what to do in times of disasters and to follow them. Kalamudur residents in other areas nearby will have easy access to medical assistance with the reopening of the Kalamudur Health Clinic. Furthermore, the clinic will be able to improve its services to people upon the completion of renovation work. This was officially reopened by the Health Minister, Lord Diafito, and a Sifolikana was then filed this report. Despite the heavy rainfall, it didn't dampen the spirits of Kolomotua residents as they celebrated the reopening of Kolomotua Health Clinic. The Minister of Health, Lord Duafitu, reopened the newly renovated clinic. The renovation work is estimated at more than 60,000 pa'anga and funded by the Australian Rotary Club. In the remarks from the guest of honour, he thanked the Rotary Club for its generous assistance. This is not a small initiative. It is a wonderful surprise and such a blessing for the people of Kolomotua. This will also help this generation and the next. The Deputy President of the Australian Rotary Club, Sydney Huda, said this is part of their voluntary assistance for local communities. With the um, assistance of the uh, Rotary Club of Tonga, we've been able to put this building to its fruition and I hope you get many years to enjoy it. Meanwhile, the nurse district of Awala told Television Tonga News that this will help better improve in the services to the public. Before the renovation work, the clinic will be leaking and flooded when it rains, but this new clinic is beautiful and secure. And we have a reception room as well. I am very happy with the renovation work done. During the program, the former president of the Nuku Alofa Rotary Club, Dr. Amanaki Fakakovi Gaetao, appealed to the Australian Rotary team to continue such assistance to local communities. More than 9,000 people who are using this clinic. There is hopeful improvement in the health standards of the people of Kolomotua with the completion of this renovation work. From Kolomotua, I am Anasi Falekano for Television Tonga News. A representative from the MG market of New Zealand, Bita Longi, is in Nokalofa for a trade agreement with the Eastern Agricultural Council. This will benefit the local farmers at the Eastern District of Tonga. For Nonga Vekoso reports. The local farmers from the Eastern District were fortunate to start discussing its trade agreement with their New Zealand counterpart, the MG market. The agreement includes exporting of local fruits and crops from the Eastern District to New Zealand. In return, these foreign markets will bring in fruits and other produce that were not available in Tonga. So MG Marketing uh, is a New Zealand growers cooperative and we distribute fruit and vegetables in New Zealand and Australia. So we're working with the uh, Tongan government and the Eastern Council to develop uh, new market opportunities for Tongan fresh produce in New Zealand. Um, we're looking at watermelon, but we're also looking at butternut squash and other products. And we hope to develop uh, some long-term business here in Tonga uh, for the benefit of the, the uh, Growers Council and the growers themselves. And uh, we hope to be able to distribute that product through New Zealand. According to the marketing officer of the Eastern District's Agriculture Council, Paula Mosaati, the meeting is to ensure a good relationship between the two parties. This initiative started earlier this year, where members of our council visited New Zealand and seek for a foreign counterpart. We therefore find this market that enables us to start exporting our produce next week. This exportation will include varieties of crops such as taro, cassava and many more. By doing this, it will benefit the country's economy and the local farmers. The meeting was attended by Lord Nuku, some of the people's representative to parliament and stakeholders. 
Meantime, some of the local farmers praise this new move. The problem is that new people give in so easily, where they start exporting then later stopped. But we hope that this new trade agreement will be sustainable. Men aren't the only one who can do this work. We can plant vegetables to support our families and to ensure that we put food on table without relying on others. In previous years, many farmers were not likely to face any problems unless introducing of fertilizers and chemicals. But currently, organic farming is popular. About 80 farmers attended this morning's meeting, which was held at the Tonunga Hall in La Baja. For Norwekoso for Television, Tonga News. The new Millennium Export Squash Pumpkin are expected to maintain its quality and freshness upon reaching its destination in the Asian markets. This is ensured through direct shipment of the produce to its foreign markets on a special vessel arranged by the Japanese suppliers. In the past, squash that was exported abroad was sent in a container shipment via New Zealand, then on to its Asian market. Today, local businesswoman Leslie Namoa is shipping the squash produce directly to its Asian counterpart. This is the first direct shipment of squash pumpkin to its Asian market. The shipment departs Nukalofa on Saturday with an expected amount of 1,500 tons. The huge benefit of this because the 12-day journey to its market is a short period, which helps maintain the quality and freshness of the squash, which is a short time that can help keep the fresh condition of the squash produce. The squash produce are directed to Japan and Korea's markets. The first stop will be Japan on the 24th of October with 700 tons of squash. The next stop is in Korea on the 26th with 800 tons. If we exceed our target, we will still ship the rest of the produce to the Japanese markets. Meanwhile, the new Millennium Exports have employed more than 100 workers to help clean, prepare and pack the squash. Mrs. Namoa also added that the quantity of the squash produce for this year Mrs. Namoa also added that the quantity of the squash produce for this year is expected to exceed last year's produce. This is due to favorable weather conditions where one kilogram of seedlings can produce more than 10 to 20 tons of squash pumpkins. At the same time, quarantine staff from the Ministry of Agriculture are carrying out the inspections on the squash produce before it's approved for export. Reporting for Television Tonga News, I'm Carlo Laine Tonglava. The Freedom of Information Policy 2012 bans the media and any individual from disseminating information or news stories that will affect the religious faith of others. This was revealed by the Director of the Ministry of Information and Communications, Paolo Mao, to Television Tonga News. Sin Lato tells you more. A concern was raised by Dongatapu People's Representative No. 9, Fani Situpo, in Parliament from people in his constituency over programs broadcast by media which contradicts or attacks their doctrines and beliefs. The Member of Parliament also said in a radio and televised program, there is an FM radio station and a television station which belittles or defames other religious beliefs and doctrines. The concern is raised because there are Christian stations which broadcast sermons which slanders other religious faith, such as the Catholic or Mormon religions. These people should remember that the 1875 Constitution is still effective up until today, and so is Article 5, which stresses the freedom of belief. Therefore, anyone and everyone should be free to choose whatever faith they want to believe in. The director of the Ministry of Information and Communication, Paula Mao, says the Freedom of Information policy was passed last year and all media outlets must follow the regulations. This concern has been raised to our ministry before. We've spoken with the manager of Dulos Broadcasting Network about his programs to speak only about their own doctrines and beliefs and not anyone else's. Meanwhile, the manager of Dulos Broadcasting Network, Barry Daugolo, says the content of their programs do not affect anyone. 
The truth is, we are not slandering or attacking other religious beliefs. Everything we say is straight from the Bible, which is the Word of God. People's Representative No. 9 insists that something be done about the matter. Tonga will be represented in a commemoration of the 10th anniversary of the UNESCO Convention for Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage, which will be held in China. A mini exhibition of traditional Tongan items was displayed at the, the Ministry of Commerce, Tourism and Labour, and it also will be dis, uh, displayed rather in the exhibition which is from the 17th until the 20th of this month. Linda Filiai tells you more. A mini exhibition was held this afternoon at the Ministry of Commerce, Tourism and Labour. These are the local Tongan handicraft that will be displayed at an expo in China for the UNESCO Convention for Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage. Tongan's team to China were led by Bensimani Fifita from the Ministry of Internal Affairs and four other exhibitors. In a speech from the Ministry of Internal Affairs Cultural Division Deputy Director, Bulupaki Moala, this is a great opportunity to promote the kingdom. This is an opportunity for us to promote the knowledge that inherited by the people here in Tonga from these generations to the next generations. And there are ways and strategies that has been presented in the presentation today in terms of website, the technology, the information that has been transmitted through various network. But you have witnessed today that the Tongans use the local product to promote handicraft, and we will exhibit it. She says Tonga became a member of the Convention for Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage after signing in 2010. The purpose of this convention to safeguard intangible cultural heritage, to ensure we respect by the communities, groups, and indiv individual concern, and to raise awareness locally, internationally, of the intangible cultural heritage. The Minister of Education and Training, Dr. Anata Felungaki, the Chinese ambassador to Tonga, and other guests were at the mini exhibition. The Tongan delegation will also attend a workshop on intangible cultural heritage during the expo. Tonga's team will leave Tonga on October 14. For Television Tongan News, I'm Linda Filiai. The Magistrate Court has reached an agreement with the Ministry of Fisheries to return more than 2,000 sea cucumbers to the ocean. These are different types of sea cucumbers which were confiscated confiscated rather from 10 people who are accused of illegally harvesting sea cucumber. Other 10 accused people ate a Tongan and two are Asians. The sea cucumbers were confiscated from Halaleva, Patanata and other areas on Wednesday this week. Some of the accused are released on bail and will appear in court next Monday. During this time, this time rather, they're not permitted to leave Don Taku. And that's your special edition with of news with Tom this week. Thank you all for joining us and for the family. Good evening.